Well, this is the Wartan Quarry, which was uh, set up in about 1876, because if you just look behind me, you'll see the, the wind sill, which is made of dolerite, and dolerite makes very good um, stone, building stone. So the Victorians were here in 1876, quarrying away, quarrying away Hadrian's Wall. So you'll see over to the far side, you'll see Hadrian's Wall, and it's suddenly just truncated as the quarry takes over. And the quarry here was operating for 100 years before finally closing in 1976. We're walking around the side of the quarry now into a wonderful wild flower meadow here and it's just gorgeous. It's, it's, it's a wash with, with orchids and, and daisies and, all, and buttercups and all sorts of flowers. However, it wasn't always like this. This was a quarry floor because we're way down below what the original surface was. But we're going to head up, and if you can see it just behind me, up to the top of the crags where Hadrian's Wall is. So just bear in mind, everything you see here is artificial and man-made, and Hadrian's Wall would have been above our heads at this point. Okay, well, we've climbed up um, the quarry uh, crag up onto Hadrian's Wall itself. I'm actually standing on Hadrian's Wall. And it would have continued if I just turned sideways over that way. It curves over to the left. And if we just look over this field wall, this quarry wall, you'll see what's happened to Hadrian's Wall. You'll see the Hadrian's Wall just falls off a quarry face, just right here. But we do know that it must have curved round to the right in a sweeping curve over towards that hill and then heading towards um, Carlisle in that direction. And at some point in this quarry, there was a turret, and it was turret 45B. And it was said to be one of the highest standing turrets on the wall, but sadly was dynamited away by the Victorians. Well, I'm here, I'm sitting on the wall, on Hadrian's wall, and it, we're on a slope, quite a sort of a significant slope. And if you just look, you'll see the wall stones are flowing down the slope here. Any uh, self-respecting stonemason or waller would have stepped the wall down at this point. But here, the Romans are actually letting it flow down, relying on the strength of their mortar to keep the wall together. However, they do occasionally also step the wall down in places. But here is a good example of um, the flow of Hadrian's wall. So if we look closely at the building of Hadrian's Wall, you will see here we've got lovely chunky facing stones here to be in square cut. And we've got an unassorted arrangement of any old stones in the centre. This is the infill material here. So all they're doing is they're, they're dressing the, the facing stone and putting anything they can find in the middle. And they're building the wall up course by course. Whenever they build a course up, they even fill it then with mortar. This is what the Romans have invented. And the facing stones are generally um, chamfered, so they chamfered inwards like this one here is. And that is to provide a key for that mortar to hold the wall together. And this is the factor why the Romans can allow the wall to flow down a slope like this, because they're relying on the strength of that mortar to hold it together. Well, we're at an interesting section of wall here. You'll see Hadrian's Wall is making a distinct change of direction here. And the lower courses are dovetailed in, as you can see. And then when you get to this one, the stone mains have actually cut this stone to follow the direction of the wall, which is uh, a neat idea here. Also, 
These big blocks, which we've discussed before, are not made of dolerite. The local st stone here, the bedrock of, of dolerite, is, is far too hard to actually have a cleavage plane. It, it can't be dressed. And so what they're using here is a hard grey sandstone, which they brought in from elsewhere. Well here you can quite easily see the full width of Hadrian's Wall behind me which is about eight foot wide or so and in some places it is narrower than this um, but here we are having full width of eight foot and even in the further in the distance you'll see it's actually even wider than that where it's been widened to actually probably go around um, some hard boulders which are in the way. So here we are one of many drainage ditches which are um, put in underneath the wall and that's because this area around here would have been very wet, very marshy, so the drainage hole has gone in to drain the water out under the wall. Here Hadrian's Wall has got a distinct bulge on it here as you can see and that's probably because within that there are boulders because looking around me we've got a hard band of rock here and they've been incorporated into the wall and you have to have the bulge in order to hold the whole thing together here. And to create this bulge they've actually uh, stepped the wall down, you can see in phases like that, so it's rather than just looking being flush it's actually stepped up here. Well here we are at a beautiful section of original wall which is in this sort of serpentine shape along here and it is probably one of the highest sections of Hadrian's Wall that still exists. Here I'm standing in front of a section of wall which is above my head and I'm about five foot seven, five foot eight, so the wall itself would probably be somewhere up there on this side. That's around about ten foot high on this side and on the far side even higher still, another five foot higher rising to about 15 foot and then the, the wall is quite wide because between the, the inner and the outer edge there would have been a walkway and that explains the width of the wall. So here I am at this section and there are actually going to be 12, at least 12 courses from the bottom here to the top. So here you might wonder why such an intact section of wall exists and it probably is because there are no buildings near here for which they would have taken the stone away to build and it's hidden behind these crags as well so we have got this wonderful sinuous section of wall still intact to a considerable height. You might also want to look at the um, the floor on the wall we've got these sort of lovely little ferns here which have got a foothold in the mortar of the wall here and are thriving in these conditions. Well this section here you can see a large quantity of the facing stones have gone here down to this course here just leaving behind all this assorted mishmash of infill stone here. So this is all gone for building stone elsewhere here.
Well, contrary to what we saw earlier on when the wall was flowing down a slope, here we've got the wall stepping down the slope. And, and it may be that the slope is too steep for the wall to flow down it here, or it may be that a different cohort of soldiers were building this section in a different way. Every section of wall was built by a group of men and when they'd finished that section, they'd put in a what we call a centurial stone built into the fabric of the wall, recording who had built that section. Well, you can see here how they put in a, a wedge-shaped piece of stone, just try and level up the courses here. There's one there, there's another one here. So in this particular section, they're trying to keep the courses relatively horizontal and then stepping it down at intervals. Well, here, here I am inside turret 45A on Hadrian's Wall. And this actually is older than Hadrian's Wall. This predates Hadrian's Wall by about um, 20, 30 years or so. This was a freestanding lookout tower that was part of the Stainegate system of fort, which is to the south of where we're standing here. And when Hadrian's Wall was built in 122 AD, then they incorporated this turret into the line of the wall, as you can see on both sides of me here. So here, here's the proof that this tower is pre-existing on Hadrian's Wall because you can see the line where Hadrian's Wall had to abut the existing structure of the turret here. So there it is running straight up and the same on the other side. Well, here I've walked down Hadrian's Wall. I'm standing on a grassy mound now. Hadrian's Wall is underneath my feet. And if you just look behind me, what we have is another Victorian quarry, which once again has taken a bite out of Hadrian's Wall, though this time a much smaller bite than the first quarry we, we saw. And Hadrian's Wall then does reappear on the far side of the quarry and then continues up those crags behind me. So here you can probably see how Hadrian's Wall is exploiting the escarpment ridge of the Great Wind Sill. Although a quarry has taken a bite out of it in the far distance you can see Hadrian's Wall coming back into view again and it's right on the edge of that escarpment ridge so there's a precipitous drop just to the north of it and this is a naturally defensive location. At this point here there's no need for a, a north ditch. Hadrian's Wall just follows the crags as close as it can up and down for as long as it possibly can. Well hello, we're at uh, Caulfields now and behind me is another quarry. If you remember last time we were at Wartown Crags, which was a huge quarry where they've taken away Hadrian's Wall to try and get the dolerite uh, underneath that. And once again here at Caulfields we've got exactly the same thing. You can see this is dolerite, they're, they're taking it out, they're crushing it for roadstone. We know this quarry was operating in 1902 and probably before that and it finally closed in 1936. So if you just look ahead, you'll see there's a small hillock and Hayden's Wall runs to the top of that hillock. And just to the left-hand side of that hillock, there is a mile castle, which is where we're going to go to next. Okay, well here we are at the south entrance of this rather large uh, Roman structure which is called a mile castle. And it's called a mile castle because these structures were placed every Roman mile along the wall. And the Roman mile is slightly shorter than English mile. English mile we all know is 1,760 yards and a Roman mile is about 1,600 yards or so. So these mile castles placed every Roman mile and in effect they were the, the, the means by which people and goods could move from beyond the wall to this side of the wall. They, they, you couldn't pass through a turret and you couldn't pass through a fort. It was the mile castles. So we can actually think of them as checkpoints in effect. So it, it really implies that Hayden's Wall when it was built 
isn't a barrier, as many people like to think, but is more a frontier zone, a frontier control zone that was controlling the passage of people through the wall. Well, I'm standing in the gateway of this mile castle, which is mile castle 42, and I'll tell you more about that in a little while. And we're going to walk up that slope, which is quite steep and quite rocky, to the north gateway. Phew, that was a bit of an uphill climb and it must have been so for the soldiers living here about 1900 years ago. There would have been about 20 to 30 men living in this mile castle and they would have been in barracks and you can see with the slope, the steep slope and the rocky nature of the terrain, it must have been quite a challenge to actually uh, live in these barracks. So they must have been sort of raised up on stilts and, and levelled up that way. Well, I'm standing in the north gateway of Mile Castle 42 and there would have been double doors here. You can see the pivot holes, one there and one here, so we know where the doors were positioned and they would have opened inwards into the Mile Castle. And I also want to draw your attention to the monumental stonework that we've got here, which is very similar to the south gateway. But what we have got here, we can clearly see the so-called scoring lines. So uh, if we zoom in, you'll see here on this stone here, we have a scored line here and another one along here. And they were done by stonemasons to tell the builders where to put the next stone because it was set back. You can see we've got, we got a step up here, another step, and then from this point onwards, the stone would have been straight up at, at this point here. Well, we talked earlier on about mile castles being every Roman mile. And this one is actually not quite in its actual measured location. It should be another sort of 20, 25 metres to the east of here. And the question is, why was it not placed there? Why was it placed here instead? Well, we earlier mentioned that mile castles acted as control points, checkpoints, and that people needed to access the, 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 the both sides of the mile castle, in fact. So further up to the east, there was a precipice. There's no way that people could actually physically get up to that point. Whereas here, if we just look around behind me, you could imagine a sort of a switchback road coming up the slope here and heading into the, the mile castle here. So it's probably put here for convenience sake. Well here we just climbed to the top of a nearby hill and we got a wonderful view looking down on that mile castle that we just visited it and you can see it's roughly square in shape and it's got very wide walls as wide as Hadrian's wall in fact and rounded corners very much like a, a miniature Roman fort and the reason why those walls are so thick is because it probably carried a walkway just like Hadrian's wall did as well. And you remember we discussed mile castles being every Roman mile and there are 80 of them along the wall. So mile castle 42 is more or less in the centre of the wall and it seems to have been a centre of operations because to the north and south of where we are there are numerous camps and these were camps for stonemasons. So it was in this area that they were quarrying stone and then dressing the face in stones and then transporting those stones to the east and, uh, and the west along Hadrian's Wall. Well here at the top of this hillock we've got a fantastic view looking eastwards and you're looking across the whole of the military zone. So behind me you can see Hadrian's Wall on the left, you can see the Mile Castle there too. And then on the right hand side you'll see some parallel lines and these are, this, this, this marks the, the line of the Vallum. But the Vallum is a substantial structure that's essentially a deep ditch flanked on either side by, by embankments. And we don't really know why the Vallum was put in but it's likely that it was um, providing a southern demarcation to create a, a military zone, as it were, rather than just having the wall. Or it might have been put in to prevent any possible incursions um, and attacks coming from the south. Well, this is um, a cross-section across the military zone of Hadrian's Wall. And you can see on this side, we haven't got the ditch here, by the way, because we've got a precipice instead. But you can see Hadrian's Wall there, and you can see the Vallum on this side here. And then in between the two, there is the military road. Now, the military road came in after both the wall and the Vallum. So the order of construction is Hadrian's Wall first, Vallum second, and then the military road came third. And the proof of that is right here. So the, the military road is the, well, the last Roman feature to be installed on Hadrian's Wall and it follows the base of the slope behind me and its purpose was to service the mile castles and the forts along Hadrian's Wall and it always keeps to the south of Hadrian's Wall. So you can see here it has to make a turn to come round Hadrian's Wall and there it runs into a problem. 
The problem is the vallum. The military road has swung round to avoid this hill here and it's run into the vallum. And this really proves that the military road was conceived of after the vallum was constructed because if they knew they were going to put a military road in, they would have moved the vallum a bit further to the south to allow enough space for the military road to go in. As it currently stands, what's happened is that the military road has run into the vallum, it's got nowhere to go, so it uses the north mound or the north embankment of the vallum and runs along that for a few yards before coming off it. We're standing here on the ditch of the Vallum, which is stretching away behind me to the east, a very fine cross section through the Vallum. And you can see there's a central main ditch, there's two what we call berms, which are flat areas on either side of that ditch, and then two mounds, a north mound and the south mound. A wonderful view of the Vallum, but spin round to look to the west, and it's completely gone. Absolutely gone. It's been ploughed out and levelled up, and there's absolutely no trace of the Vallum whatsoever. Right behind me, you might spot two standing stones, one small, one large, known as the Mare and the Fole. And those standing stones are far older than Hadrian's Wall. They must be about 5,000 years old. And they were here when Hadrian's Wall was being built. So it must be remarkable for those, because they'd be highly vis visible to the builders on the wall at that point. It seems that there would have been a small circle here of around about 12, maybe 15 stones, uh, and only two are now upright with a third one which is lying down. Uh, and the circle would have been about six metres in diameter. Well, we're here at Core Gap, which is about a mile east of uh, Corfield's Milecastle, where we've just been. And I brought you here to show you the re-emergence of the ditch. So the ditch is on my left-hand side. You can see it has a very clear V-shaped notch in the landscape. It's been put back here because this land is quite low, therefore it is vulnerable. And the, the Romans are actually creating that ditch as an extra barrier, an extra protection um, in front of the wall itself. And over on my right is the wall coming through at this point here. And in front of me is, are the windshield crags. And for our next visit, we're going to be going over the windshield crags to Steel Rig, and you'll be able to join us at that point there. Right, hello, well thank you for joining me once again on our journey of discovery along Hadrian's Wall, looking at the, the less uh, known features along Hadrian's Wall. So we're here at Steel Rig and we're going to be doing this section between Steel Rig and Sycamore Gap. Um, not very far, only about a, a mile or so along the wall, but full of lots of interesting features. So here, Steel Rig, one of the classic viewpoints of Hadrian's Wall. Just look at that view behind me, with the wall stretching ahead over the windsill, clambering up and down the windsill, heading towards Housters and beyond uh, to the east. Um, a magnificent view, fantastic when the sun is setting in the end, at the end of the day. Uh, in, in particular. But there are some differences here to what we saw earlier on our earlier visit to Caulfields. Um, and the one uh, difference, major difference, is the wall here on my left. Well, I'm standing next to Hadrian's Wall right here, but it's very different to the wall we saw at Caulfields on our previous section. This is very different in many ways. One, it's same height. Two is that there's turf on the top of it and three is that there's no mortar binding these stones together. It's essentially a dry wall. And you may ask, well, why is there a difference between these two types of wall, original and rebuilt wall in effect? And it all comes down to one man who's called John Clayton. John Clayton lived from the sort of late 19th, 18th century right up to about 1890. And so he was a Victorian. And his father lived at Chester's house, which is next to Chester's fort. And John eventually inherited that estate. Now, unlike his father, John had a great interest in the wall and in, on basically on his father's lawn. And he, he wanted to dig to see what was beneath the surface, which he started to do. And he developed a really strong passion for the wall and all its uh, treasures. So as he inherited the estate, he had enough money then to buy up 
plots of land containing the war, as well as the forts as well. And once he'd done that, he then began to sort of find, excavate and find all these treasures. And over time, he accumulated a vast treasure trove of artifacts, including altars and statues and inscriptions, many of which now are on display in the John Clayton Museum at Chester's Fort. Well, John Clayton lived at a time when the Victorians were almost actively destroying the wall. They were either quarrying it away or they were taking it away for new building. Now John, essentially by buying up land containing the wall, was protecting it. He stopped that quarrying taking place and he forbade the taking away of the stones for building new buildings as well. And he also would move buildings that are actually on the wall or some of its features to, an, to another location. So by doing so, he effectively was protecting the wall and its features, and he is regarded as the man who saved the wall. We're here at um, a location called Peel Gap, and you can see there's sort of a natural valley just behind me here, with uh, Hadrian's Wall on either side of that. Now, there was a problem here for the Romans. There was a turret over on that headland there, which is turret 39A, and another, head, another turret over on this side at turret 39B. And both those turrets were so far away from this central area that neither of them could adequately monitor what was happening in this gap. Now, we know that the pattern of the Roman structures was mile castle, turret, turret, mile castle, turret, turret, mile castle, and so on. And so the archaeologists were not expecting to find anything unusual here, but that that's exactly what they found in 1987. It's astonishing to think that the turret at the bottom of here was only discovered in 1987, after all those centuries. And it's probably because the archaeologists didn't expect to find a third turret here. And the reason why it wasn't there was because it's completely covered over in grass, mud, silt, whatever, for centuries. And so it's hidden from view, so nobody knew it was there. And if you do look closer at the bottom of the hill here, you see its original wall has come back in again because that was all below the surface at one point and therefore hidden from view. So Peel Gap Turret is at the bottom of this valley. So let's go down and have a look at it. Well, I'm here at the bottom of Peel Gap. So before we climb up, I just want to show you the wall here, original wall and the turret beyond it. And now I'm going to climb up this rock staircase to the top of the crags. We've just climbed up onto the crags and I, here I am sitting on Hadrian's Wall and I'm surrounded by a wonderful assemblage of uh, flora here. So just next to me I've got ladies' bed straw here, so called because it was used to sort of soften the mattresses that ladies slept in. And then just beyond that we've got harebells here, the beautiful deep blue of the harebells and there's many other wildflowers all around me here. We're back on 
the rebuilt wall again. And if you look behind me, you'll see, you can see the full width of Hadrian's Wall, but part of the rebuilt built wall is only on this side, which extends a little bit higher than behind it. We're here at Milecastle 39 on Hadrian's Wall. If you remember, we were at uh, Caulfields, Milecastle 42. So this is another three Roman miles on from Caulfields to the east. And this Milecastle is not in its true measured position once again. And that's because it lies in a dip. This is called Castle Nick. And therefore, Milecastle's acting as checkpoints where people could pass through. It needed to be somewhere where people could pass through it. And that's exactly what you have here. So not only did this mile castle have to be down in a dip to allow people and goods to pass through the wall, it also had to maintain signalling with Barkham Hill behind me. There was a major Roman signal station on there communicating to a wide arc of Hadrian's Wall and this was just one of the mile castles communicating with that signal station. I'm standing in the north gateway of this mile castle. It would have been a, an arch above me, double doors and a tower above all that. And there were still the socket holes for those doors still in place, one on that side and one at that side. And if you look behind me, we're down in this dip. So this is, you know, people and goods could easily just come up, presumably by pack animal, and then come through this mile castle. So inside this mile castle, there are the remains of the barrack blocks that would have supported anywhere between 20 and 30 soldiers here. The previous mile castle, Caulfields, had no indication of the barracks here, but, uh, barracks, but we do have that here. And the soldiers would have been given a, a daily ration of, uh, of grain, which they would grind to make flour, and then they would bake it in an oven outside the mile castle. I'm here sitting on the wall at the top of another so-called nick and in the bottom of this nick or gap if you like is a rather special tree. It's a sycamore tree and it is wonderfully framed by the Hadrian's Wall on either side of it and so this area is known as Sycamore Gap and it is well photographed, much loved and it probably is one of the most photographed locations in the whole of the UK in fact and the tree itself was actually voted tree of the year um, in the UK in 2016. Oh, well, here I am under the spreading boughs of a sycamore tree. And this is the sycamore tree that was made famous in the film Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, starring Kevin Costner. And it was here that Kevin Costner, aka Robin Hood, came across Sir Guy Gisborne, who had trapped a little boy up this tree, who had been accused of, um, uh, of stealing um, a, a deer or something like that. So it's, 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 it's a film location spot, and it's a, a place where people just love to come and sit and enjoy the shade, and then admire the view of the tree from the south.
We've just walked a, a few yards to the south of Sycamore Gap in order to appreciate the fine view that we get from here. You can see the tree and it's very clearly framed by the, by the slope on either side. Hadrian's Wall is coming down at that point, behind the tree and then up the other side. It is this classic, iconic view which you see everywhere. The next section that we're going to be covering will be from Brocolicia, otherwise known as Carabra, towards Chester's. And for now, I cannot think of a finer place to end this particular section of Hadrian's Wall. So, until next time. Well, that concludes section two of this memorable journey along Hadrian's Wall in this celebration year. I do hope you're enjoying it so far. If you'd like to see the film in its entirety, that is also posted on this channel. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe switch on the notifications so you're always up to date with the latest releases and give us a like. The final section of this journey is the eastern section which takes us into the city of Newcastle and the wall's beginning or end, whichever way you look at it, uh, at wall's end. So I look forward to seeing you for that. <laughs>